people uh, took what I said about Connor the wrong way. You know what I mean? Like, you know, I don't want to be like that. Like, I really don't. Like, I, I you know, I'm me. I'm always going to be me. And I really don't want to be nothing else. Yeah, them glasses was like three grand, man. Two buffaloes had to die to make them glasses, man. This solid gold pocket watch. Three people died making this watch, you know what I mean? Need more examples? If I leave and go to the lightweight division, the featherweights go back to the prelims. He's gonna headline because of me. After that, he's going back to the prelims. Don't get me wrong, I like the kid. He's a quiet little hillbilly. I like Kiesa, he's a good guy. I change your bum look. I'm gonna change his life. Good thing Lee's not a comic. When I talk about Kevin Lee's imaginary potential, I'm not just talking about his abilities as a fighter. I'm also talking about his struggles with his own identity, his self-confidence, and his ability to sell a fight. It was during this time that the UFC was looking for another star to potentially fill the void of Conor McGregor who hadn't competed since 2016 after beating Eddie Alvarez. At this time, we saw several fighters attempt to try to replicate the success that Conor had all of whom came off phony with their fumes of desperation, making fans cringe with their obvious failed attempts to adopt the persona that worked for Connor. As you saw in the beginning of this video, Kevin Lee was the biggest example of this. So whenever he tried denying it, he came off extremely delusional, showing a complete disconnect from what the fans thought of him based on the evidence that was out there. I already got like people hitting me up on Twitter and blah 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 saying I'm trying to be like Connor, man. Fuck Connor, I ain't trying to be like none of that. If anything, he's trying to be like me. You see all his stuff, you know, he, he, he's trying to take from our culture, from hood culture, from, uh, from hip hop culture. Uh, if anything, it ain't nothing better than being young, black, and rich, so I'm going to keep it going. Young, black, and rich? <laughs> <laughs> Who does he think he's fooling here pretending that he's rich? Until that moment, he made a decent living, but not what most would consider to be rich. The most out-of-touch thing he said here was that Connor was trying to imitate him. This is the scrub who got knocked out by a jiu-jitsu guy in Leonardo Santos the same night Connor made history by sleeping Jose Aldo in 13 seconds. I'd be willing to bet everything in Lee's bank account that Connor didn't even know he existed at that point, like most MMA fans didn't. However, I could actually sense his inner monologue trying to course correct in the middle of that sentence. Because what he meant to say from the beginning was that he thinks Connor is stealing from black culture. Not Kevin Lee in particular, because that just doesn't make any rational sense at all. But then again, this is Kevin Lee we're talking about. Yet, even that change he went to was complete nonsense. Because Lee's just regurgitating the false narrative that charismatic white fighters, like Connor, have somehow stolen their personas to sell fights from black fighters like Floyd Mayweather or Muhammad Ali long before him, while not realizing that Ali himself took from Gorgeous George, a white pro wrestler. Don't believe me? Check this out. I saw a wrestler once named Gorgeous George, and the place was jam-packed with people. Cars was lined up for miles. They hated Gorgeous George. They wanted him to beat, but they paid $100 for a ringside seat. So I, I got this from Gorgeous George. I said, ooh, this is a good idea. Look, he's getting rich. So I start talking. I am the greatest. I cannot be beat. I'm too pretty to be a fighter. It's nearly impossible to pull off bashing the guy whose career Lee's desperately trying to copy. We've all heard that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery expression. So if Connor isn't all that, then why is he stealing all of his quotes? Kevin Lee is the single white female to Connor McGregor. He wants him gone, but also wants everything he has, but he's just not good enough to get it. Dana love me. Yeah. Me, me and Dana, we boys. Yeah? yeah? You guys yeah. hang out? A couple of times, a couple of times. Really? Yeah. Wow. What'd Especially... you guys do? Did you notice what happened there? Kevin implies that him and Dana are boys and have hung out a couple of times which intrigues Ariel, so he asks about their supposed friendship. Are you guys hanging out? Uh, a couple of times, just around the PI and stuff. Oh, okay, you know, okay, we, okay. We'll, we'll see each other. Break bread. Did you see how quickly Lee backpedaled after Ariel's simple question that revealed that Kevin and Dana are actually just acquaintances who have never hung out together outside of the workplace? This might not seem like a big deal on the surface, but it's things like this that Kevin does constantly to fake sale that he's a bigger deal than he really is. You know, trying to be like Connor. Pretending he's tight with the boss, but when pressed on that claim, his story quickly falls apart. He's like Chris Farley's character in Billy Madison, pretending that he slept with Veronica Vaughn until Billy calls him out on it, making him back down immediately from his lie. I told him to, to, to give me a ride in his Ferrari. You know, he gave uh, uh, Connor a ride yeah, yeah. the first goddamn night. I know, right? Sport for a minute. Yeah, what's up with that? I deserve a ride. Did he Ferrari. give you one? 
A Ferrari? Yeah, no, did he give you a ride at least? No, no, I'm just. No, he didn't give you. Okay. Not yet, not yet, not yet. But it, it but it'll get there. And, and, and I'm gonna get my own. I ain't even worried about it. Yeah. In Connor's absence, Kevin sees the moment at the UFC Summer Kickoff press conference, trying to replicate what Connor did before, talking crap to anyone and everyone, not just his opponent. With some success, I will say. I ain't even gonna talk no shit. I ain't up here to shit talk. You know, Mike over there. You know, they both. Shit talking over there. Mike Johnson talking about he going to kill somebody. He got 30 fights, lost half of them. Ain't killed the motherfucker yet. So, uh, you know, I like Mike. I like Kiesa. He's a good guy. Uh, I'm doing him a favor, you know. I'm, 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 I'm going to change his life on June 25th. I'm carrying hey, like you know I'm the one out here knocked horses. out by jujitsu. Uh, Shut the fuck up. It don't matter how many weeks he get to prepare, he stands no chance. I actually give him respect for taking a fight that he knows that he's not gonna. You know it, his best chance at winning is if I make a stupid mistake. Uh, he make realizes that it, the only reason he took the fight is because it's an OKC. I'm gonna carry him through this car. He's gonna headline because of me. After that, he's going back to the prelims. The problem with Kevin stealing these specific insults from Connor is that they don't make any sense for him to say. Kiesa's name was way bigger than Lee's was at this point. Connor had a nation behind him as soon as he came to the UFC, where Kevin couldn't even get a main event slot until his 11th fight with the company. That's right, this man fought 10 times prior and not one of them was a main event. So who did he think he was fooling pretending that Kiesa is in a main event because of him? At least Colby clearly plays a character whenever he pretends that he's a draw. Lee's not. He's just terrible at trash talking and isn't clever enough to come up with his own material. But I just hope uh, he shows up because I know his mama got tickets. So shut know, the fuck up about hey, you can, don't talk world. about my mom for one. Don't you ever talk about my mom. Don't you ever talk about my fucking mom. Don't you ever talk about my fucking mom. Mama, dad, I whatever, get in the middle. Like whatever you want to call it. I'm smack uh, the fuck out of you right now. Don't you ever talk about my mom. Yeah, don't you ever yeah, talk yeah, about yeah, yeah, yeah. What's good? This, of course, elevated the interest of their fight to a whole nother level. After defeating Kiesa, Kevin did a post-fight interview where Tony Ferguson was at the desk. Here, he seized yet another moment to go back and forth with Tony. The one thing my question was, was when he had you in that 100%, when he DDT'd you, how did that make you feel? How, did that wake you up, or did you, were you just like, okay, or did it, did it hurt? What, what was going on in your head when, as soon as you guys slammed on the mat? Uh, I'm not sure what you're talking about. I don't even know what a DDT is. I think that's a WWE move. Yep. Uh, I'm pretty sure I'm the one that lifted him in the air, so I don't see how he's slamming me if I got him on my shoulder. You know, I mean, can I put a real, can we put a real journalist on? I, you know, before the fight, you were saying I had my left hand down. He was going to hit me with the right hand, and he's a southpaw. Hey, buddy, you, you know, it didn't even make too, sense. Man. So, I mean, hey. can, let, let, let's, let's throw on another, uh, a real journalist. I, I don't even know if he really watched the fights or you think I trained over at Mayweather's gym doing boxing only, you know, or not doing wrestling. I, didn't, I don't understand it. So uh, let's look, go. Man, throw one thing I have to say is, look, to you, congratulations Tyrone. to your fight, but you're calling out Khabib. You're just like Alec Kinta. I can't understand anything that you say. All you're saying is just a whole bunch of hoopla. Yeah, but I'm fighting. You need to get you know, in line. Alan, you need Alan to get in line, son. Alan you fought need to take years, a ticket you know, and you need to bleed a little bit. You need to go through guys like Edson Barbosa, Rafael Dos Anjos, man. You're just barely yeah, breaking into this Yeah, but you're talking thing. to somebody with more. All you're doing you, is this, you, man. You're talking to you somebody with more fights in the same amount of time right as right you. Here. Especially elbows and knees and kicks. I don't want to take your pride from you. Look, congratulations <laughs> on your fight. You did an amazing job. Would we have liked to see more fight come out of you? Absolutely. I'm excited for your next fight. I, I would have too. I would have. I would have liked to show more. I mean, I mean, again, you're talking to somebody that's got more fights in the same amount of time as you. So I'm, I'm fighting whoever they put me, put in my way. Uh, if I take somebody like, you know, Edson Barboza, you know, all these dudes that's already down the hill. Sure, yeah, I'll take them right next. I'll, I mean, you can get it in. We can get it in in, de in December. It ain't nothing. So I mean, you, you don't talking, meet the standards, like, bro. You don't nobody. meet the standards. I'm, I'm you, taking you, stupid fights. You gotta fights. keep trying. You gotta keep talking. You gotta keep building your brand. Keep doing your thing. Oh, Mo I gotta now. fight. Some Somebody like Lando. I got to fight somebody that's coming off the UFC debut. Oh, I'm sorry. I, my bad. Hey, you know I'll what? You're going to have your hands full. The only thing that I have to say is no matter what you're going to do as far as your career, you're going to keep moving forward. And I have to praise you for that. You're an I athlete. Suggest, you're I an suggest athlete. You, you have the decent fight. hands. But compared to myself and compared to a lot of these higher level fighters, <laughs> this is the one fighter that you had. Yeah, Michael Chiesa. Again, I was supposed to again, fight Michael I'll, Chiesa. And the one thing is, is 
I will eat you up for lunch, but that's not the case because you don't meet my standards on this. You have to put in your time, kid. And that's I'm all you, cool, kid. but right now you're playing. The, I, look, 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 I'm trying to give you advice. Right now you're playing the, you playing a reporter role. You're not There's doing no reporter the, role. I, they I asked me to come about, here because you know? they like the, my style. They like the way that yeah, I finish yeah, my Yeah, yeah, yeah. And again, you might you might want to do your job a little bit better. That's all I'm saying. You might want to do your job. You might you might want to. But you know what? Like I said, you have to earn your right because there's a lot of other fighters out there that are going to We can do it. It'd be easy money. Oh, easy money for sure. Sure. Yeah. This interaction created a lot of buzz amongst fans. So the UFC scheduled Tony Ferguson versus Kevin Lee for the interim lightweight championship, thinking that Conor would come back and face the winner. However, it was revealed later down the line that Conor was getting ready to face Floyd Mayweather Jr. in a boxing match. Nonetheless, the UFC had to move on and wanted to build another star, whether it be in Kevin or Tony. Ferguson ended up defeating Lee by triangle choke in round number three. During the fight, it was brought to the attention of everyone that Lee had competed with a staph infection, which may have led to him underperforming against Tony. Having a staph infection is a legit excuse and all, but Lee has also shown his inability to pace himself throughout a fight as time went on. So looking back at that night, I really don't see Lee being able to survive five rounds against that version of Tony under any circumstances, but that's just my opinion. If you're showing anger, if you show showing emotion, that's weakness. <laughs> After losing to Tony, the UFC still had hope for Kevin Lee's supposed potential. They matched him up with Edson Barboza, where he missed weight but won by Dr. Stoppage in the fifth round. Oh, I'm so in love with you. After that, they booked him for a rematch with Al Iaquinta after Al went five rounds with Khabib. I'm sure the UFC did this for two reasons. The first was to see how much Kevin had grown as a fighter since the first time he lost to Al while the second was to gauge how Lee would measure up against Al in comparison to how Al measured up against Khabib. Since Lee had always talked about fighting Khabib, I'm sure this was in the minds of the UFC brass. Unfortunately for Kevin, he lost to Al once again. Lee came out saying that he was done cutting to 155, claiming that it just took too much out of him. So the UFC matched him up with another former lightweight who now fights at welterweight in Rafael Dos Anjos. However, Lee lost to him as well via arm triangle in the fourth round. Considering that RDA is yet another guy who lost to Khabib, it wasn't looking good for him and his supposed chances of beating the guy. This isn't a styles make fights debate. It's levels. If Kevin Lee had trouble taking RDA down, then how would his style do against trying to take Khabib down? I'm not saying that Kevin never had a shot at beating Khabib. MMA is a crazy sport where almost anything can happen. However, when one guy consistently shows that he's not as good as he claims to be, while the other one consistently shines through, it's hard to speak words that are somehow louder than actions. Plus, from a stylistic standpoint, there's really nothing about Kevin's style that appeared to pose this supposed threat to Khabib. Here's what Kevin said after his loss to RDA. I don't know. Don't know what happened out there tonight. Thought I did everything right leading up to this fight. Tried to eliminate every little distraction, everything that wasn't good for me. I, mean, I swear I felt like something, everything was just falling into place and was talking to me even before I walked out there. It still wasn't enough, you know. This sometimes it'd be like high as highs and low as lows. It should really make you question what you believe in. But, I don't know. You know, I've been through a lot of shit in my life. This ain't, really ain't gonna be. What I saw in this video was not only a guy who was upset that he had lost, but also a guy who was maybe coming to the realization that he is just not as good as he was hoping he was, which had shown even more as time went by and Lee ended his career in the UFC going 2-5 and five in his last seven, jumping back down to 155 to face future champion Charles Oliveira while missing weight. No shame in losing to Charles, but then he lost to Daniel Rodriguez at 170, who's an unranked fighter. Little. So for those of you who try to say that Kevin Lee always fought the best, no he didn't. They gave him a bounce back fight with D-Rod and he still couldn't deliver. Which is also what I meant when I talked about Kevin Lee's imaginary potential. Not only was he unoriginal with his trash talk, but I never bought into his amazing talent like so many others did. We've all heard people say that Kevin has so much potential, but what real potential did he have? He was an explosive athlete, but he had terrible cardio fading in so many of his fights after a round or two. 
He didn't have God-given knockout power with his hands or an amazing chin either. The reality was that he had good takedowns of a pretty good top game, but had rudimentary striking skills and a pretty poor fight IQ. Some of these things can obviously be improved on, hence the potential part, but some of these things he simply didn't have naturally and are God-given abilities. How long is it supposed to take for his imaginary potential to be realized? In comparison to other fighters that the UFC has, I didn't see Lee's potential superseding so many other obvious talents to the point where he got as much buzz as he did. I guess some people were influenced by his delusional self-belief, but I actually like to focus on Guy's actions instead of his words. Call me crazy. Khabib and, and all this, like his style is, it's good. It's obviously very good, but I can see a lot of holes in it. I can see a lot of holes in it. So it begins. You knew this topic was coming. I strongly believe that one of Lee's biggest issues that led to his downfall in the UFC was his complete obsession with Khabib. There's a fine line between belief and delusion, where a fighter truly thinks they somehow have what it takes to beat the seemingly unstoppable champ. Regardless of his obsession, Kevin should have had enough of a reality check to at least stop talking about Khabib, seeing as that he was no longer anywhere near down the line to be matched up against him. Lee still mentioning Khabib's name just made him look like a crazy ex-girlfriend who's jealous about how each of their lives ended up, with him getting the short end of the stick. And I know Khabib's talking about trying to retire and all this before, you know, he really is even getting a, a serious challenge. So I ain't, I ain't got no, no interest in somebody like that. I'm looking for bigger and better challenges. Bigger and better challenges than the undefeated fighter who was on most top three pound-for-pound pound lists and who ended up being an all-time great. What does it take to beat Habib Nurmagomedov? And just keep moving. I mean, the, the man is, I, I, I think, I, I've already seen those holes. Al, Al I went to, he exposed them a little bit, uh, this fight with him. But I, I've seen those holes for many years, and, and I feel like I, I match up real well against him. You know, I can't give away all the secrets, obviously, but uh, it, very beatable man. Hmm. So Al showed holes in this fight with Khabib where he lost every minute, but you being a similar style of a fighter who lost to Al twice somehow doesn't negate this. And lastly, Habib did comment on Joe Rogan saying GSP April 2021. What do you make of that? When he gets ready for that fight, I'm, I'm going to be in his corner and, uh, and you know, I, I'll, I'll be part of his training camp and, and help him get ready for that. I feel like uh, I know Khabib's game in in and out and uh, we're going to come up with something real nice. And, and, you know, Khabib's good. I give it to him, but he ain't. He ain't there. So Khabib isn't there, implying that he's not at the level. But you are, Kevin? Is that why GSP is in desperate need of Lee's assistance if GSP versus Khabib were to have ever happened? GSP's accomplishments alone isn't enough to take on Khabib, yet Lee knows Khabib so well for a guy he's never fought. You know what? Khabib impressed me this week, and I'm going to come down the lightweight, and I think I can help out George St. Pierre in case they fight. Like, bro, shut the fuck up. No one even cares. Like, is that guy kidding? I think Khabib only has a few more fights left in him. He's undefeated. Mm -hmm. He smashes everybody. Yeah. You know, and I think he'll go down as one of the greatest that ever did it. If he beats George. If he beats George. If he beats George. Well, if he, he can even get George. George in there. I mean. If he could even get George in there. I mean, who uh, the fuck knows how that, if that could ever play out. Yeah. I mean, I want that date with him. But we'll, 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 we'll see how that whole thing It also, play out. for the UFC, but, it wouldn't be for a title. For some reason, Rogan had Leon right after his second loss in a row to another opponent that Khabib had previously dismantled. What's funny about this clip is how quickly Joe changed the subject after Kevin was completely and hilariously oblivious to how ridiculous it was for him to still mention Khabib's name. Based on recent events, the matchup was no longer compelling and had zero interest from the fans at this point. Lee desperately needed a new angle to sell himself to the public because the icy holes farce no longer had legs to stand on if it ever did. Are you saying that these guys like, you know, Habib, these guys are overrated, that we in the media overrate them for whatever reason, and that guys you like... You definitely do. You definitely do. And, and, it's, and it's understandable, you know what I mean? Because that's where, that's what's going to bring the money in for y'all. No. It has nothing to do with the money. It's really not, but, you know, you the guy with the, with the bow tie and shit in front of the camera. <laughs> 24 so, and 0. 24 and 0. Undefeated. I mean, how, how could we not pay attention to him? Because he ain't fought a top fighter, you know what I'm saying? You know, he fought Michael Johnson. Yeah, he fought Michael Johnson. And, He's and currently he ranked sixth. He fought, he fought Dos Anjos. So, yeah, I mean, he, those are top fighters. Who, who else are you going to have a fight except for me? 
Uh, he's going to fight somebody like Barboza or something like that, but I don't think he's going to take that fight. He don't want the problem. Who do you think wins, Khabib or Barbosa? <laughs> Habib yes. picked a good fight. I, I'll give him that. He what picked a good fight. You, think uh, you like that matchup for him? I like the matchup for him. Which is it, Kev? If I'm being honest, you know, you know, I've been trying to go after Khabib for years and all this, but but after seeing his last two fights, uh, he would have beat me. He would have beat me the way I was. Like I, I would have wore myself out. Um, his cardio is just. It, it would have just. He would have beat me. Not skill for skill. Skill for skill. I don't think there's a man uh, on, on the planet that can beat me. But with the way that I was and the way that I was training and just kind of killing myself, uh, he, he would have beat me. So now I got a, I, I got a different goal in, in mind, and, and I know that that belt going to be mine as long as everything's A1. Welcome to reality. The prelim phenom finally acknowledged what the rest of the MMA world already knew. I strongly believe that Kevin's manufactured feud with Khabib added more pressure than he was capable of handling. This goes back to me saying that Lee didn't know how to sell himself. First, he was the Connor wannabe who stole his lines that he used that didn't make any sense for him to say. Once he got exposed for that, he focused on the I see holes gimmick, claiming that he was the guy to beat Khabib. That didn't pan out either. Towards the end of Kevin's UFC run, his career clearly hadn't unfolded how he envisioned, creating a ton of doubt. Constantly jumping back and forth from 155 to 170 with not much success. Claiming that the perfect weight for him would be at 165, while also trying to sell that he'd be a champion in that division if it existed. Which was his new angle he was pushing after he didn't succeed at 155 or 170. In reality, this didn't make any sense because all the guys who beat him at lightweight and welterweight could also make 165. Hell, there are plenty of top fighters at 170 like Colby who could easily make 165. All that did was create a built-in excuse as to why his goal hadn't been achieved. We saw even more signs of doubt than ever before with Kevin needing to get an awful head tattoo of a samurai helmet? At least that's what he said it was, stating that he got it because he needed the extra motivation. That says a lot when you need to get a terrible tattoo that could possibly prevent you from ever getting a normal job, forcing him to keep fighting as a professional because his drive was fading. This was a solid example of Lee questioning his determination when things didn't go his way. Another would be him wanting to take a long time off after his loss to Charles Oliveira. It'd probably be a good minute before y'all see me again. You said it would be a, probably a good minute before we see you again. So is it about really just getting your head in the right place, taking some time? Yeah, I think so. I think I got to evaluate some things. Um, I felt like my camp was great. Mm -hmm. My coaches told me all the right things to do. Mm -hmm. I abandoned it. It's all on me on this one. So, yeah, it's going to be maybe a few years or so. Really? Years? Hmm. Kevin showed similar signs of insecurity even early in his UFC career. Like when he got butt hurt that Ariel didn't have him on his show sooner than he did. All because Lee had this sense of entitlement pretending that he did something special at this point of his career when he really didn't. Beating zero ranked opponents and not being seen as this worthy contender before the Kiesa fight. By the time he finally got on Ariel's show, Kevin let out his frustrations that he had while Ariel responded. You sent this tweet out July of 2014. You were 1-0 and at that point because you were coming off a loss to Ally Aquinta. So your, your winning streak was 1 at that point. Okay, but look, that ain't the only... That so ain't I'm going to be knocking at your door for beating look, look, Jesse yeah, Ronson? You, you tell other fighters to promote themselves and blah, blah, blah. You know, everybody should, you know, get on there and get yeah. Conor McGregor it up. You know, get on Twitter and, like, talk about the shit, blah, blah, blah. But that ain't really going to get you nowhere if you don't get the airtime, you know? Well, uh, I feel, okay, so I talked about this. Picking who gets the airtime. So I talked about this after your last fight, which was a great win. And I said there's a fine line between, like, you know, shooting too far in your call out and calling out the right person. And when you said, you know, people want to see me and Khabib, I was like, I, I felt like you overshot it, but I felt like I hadn't seen that kind of talk out there. Khabib was about to fight for the belt and it fell on deaf ears. You showed up, you did the little, you know, you didn't make you do the little post media scrum or whatever. You came over. I was like, there. Okay. Ask me like one question. I ain't <laughs> give you no, I ain't really give you no sound bite. So you got up and walked away and I was like, all right, bro. Like I, I guess that's how it is. Oh this man. Was, You're a was, sensitive was, guy, right? I, I respect this, that. This was like a year. Are you sensitive? I mean, I'm not sensitive. You're sensitive. I'm sensitive. I'm just letting you know how I feel. Okay, I, I, I respect that because I'm very sensitive. Like, you have thin skin. Admit it. Okay, so you tell me now that your, your biggest fight, biggest stage was the one, uh, the win over Trinaldo. That was less than a month ago, March 11th. Here you are, April 3rd on the show. I feel like we are responding accordingly. 
<laughs> I suppose. I suppose. I, I suppose. You finally I, have a big yeah, fight on right. a big on a big stage, right, yeah. and here I am. I, Listen, I you're right, but I'm just saying, like I'm feeling some type of way, so I'm gonna let you know. That's it. Listen, man, well, I don't have time you know, for I mean, no fight past prelim. You know, you gotta you gotta make it worth our while. <laughs> It sounds like you're a little sensitive, and I get that. I mean, it's fine. <laughs> I'm sensitive too. But let's. What's the biggest fight you've had up until this point, Michael Kessa? What's the biggest fight? Like the biggest, highest stage possible? For sure, Francisco. Uh, yeah. You know, this, this last fight. Yeah. And I wasn't there. This is probably the first time I had ever heard Ariel bust a fighter's balls like this. I mean, it didn't compare to the shop beating, but it was still pretty entertaining. It's also not the last time Ariel would mess with Kevin. Did you watch the Ally Quinta Donald Cerrone fight? Yeah, of course. I mean, how how could I, how could this be a, a, a interview with Ariel without bringing up Al? So go ahead, go ahead, fire I just, off. Uh, I, just I know want, you got twenty questions. No, I just got one. I just wanted to know what you thought about it. You love to bring up Ally Quinta every time we do an interview or every time we talk. And, and for the record, we've been talking now for ten minutes, Kevin. I haven't even uttered the name Ally Quinta. So what do you? I mean, I did it for you. Yeah, I did what, it for you. The, uh, I jumped the gun. He was not even on my radar. He was not even on my, my bad. mind. Sorry, that was your next question. No, that was it wasn't my next question. question. Sorry, just, how, how long was this interview? 15, 20 minutes. <laughs> Come on. It was. It was in there. It was in there. You got it written down on that little. Uh, I, I see you. I got it's nothing written down. I don't write my question. I moved on. Last time you were on, you said it loud and clear. No more Ally Quinta questions. Questions, and so I, I got the message. To Lee's credit, he was actually kind of funny here with how he handled Ariel trolling him by bringing up Al's name. Even though it must have bothered him deep down because being 0-2 against Al would ultimately halt his momentum to the top. One thing that I've hated is is that, you know, people just stop seeing the, the sport for what it is and, you know, kind of get a little too lost in the in the drama and the bullshit. Uh, I'm trying to get it back to, to the real. And, you know, that's, that's what I'm going to do this weekend. <laughs> Mike Johnson talking about he gonna kill somebody. He got 30 fights, lost half of them. Ain't killed the motherfucker yet. I'm gonna carry him through this car. He's gonna headline because of me. After that, he's going back to the prelims. They throwing him softballs like Diego Sanchez. I haven't fought a Diego Sanchez in my career yet. I don't, I don't get them kind of, kind of softballs. Do you consider this the most important fight of your career? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's the, the biggest fight that I've had. Ugh. That's embarrassing. It's hard to promote like the black uh, a black fighter. You know they haven't broken into the, the African American market yet. Shut up. Ugh, not this again. I already dissected this bullshit on my T Wood video. They know that George ain't gonna take a fight that he don't think he can win, and I think we all kind of know George don't think he can beat me. <laughs> you feel like you're top five, one seventy already. Yeah, for sure. Kevin Lee, man, he's on Ariel. He's talking. I'm basically, I'm basically top five already. Ugh. The guy has, the guy hasn't beat one single person at 170 yet, has he? Did he win one fight? He won the first fight, maybe. No, uh, I, I think the only time he fought at 170 was RDA, and he lost. What he the lost. hell is this guy talking? What the hell is Kevin Lee talking about? He's talking about. I'm, I mean, I'm basically top five already. In <laughs> what world? Like he doesn't even know. Have you been keeping up your boy Kevin lately, or what? Top five welterweight, basically. <laughs> basically. What fucking what bizarro world is that guy? Uh, Tony Ferguson, uh, is that a fight that would ever interest you if he decided to come up to one seventy? Because I don't know what his plans are going forward, but obviously three in a row now, it's going to be tough. That was a fight that I was interested in uh, up until I, I saw um, him just get dismantled by by Oliveira, um, especially on the ground, you know. That one would would, would kind of hurt my heart a little bit because I, I would beat him so bad that that it would uh yeah it, it would take away from our first fight. So that that's one I, I would do it. Of course I would do it. You know, easy money is easy money at this point. But um I, I think he's too far gone and I think he's uh too, too far over the hill. So that you know I, I don't like beating up on people that that don't uh, put up a good fight. Kevin says this like Charles didn't just beat his ass in his fight previously to Tony. At least Tony didn't get finished by Charles like Lee did. There's no rationality as to why Kevin assumes that a rematch with him and Tony would go any differently just because he lost to Charles recently. These next couple clips really did blow my mind with how entitled and out of touch Kevin Lee really is. You told me that you had a message that you wanted to get out to the people. What is that message? I was going to come on here and I was going to scream and I was going to holler about how much I wanted a rematch. I do feel like we should have a rematch. 
It's nice that you feel that way, but the reality is you do not deserve a rematch. He won, you lost while missing weight, so matchmaking-wise, you both move on. You know, I feel like, especially with, with, the, with the event that we put on, it, it, a, re, a rematch definitely should, should be warranted. You know, I, I think we had two more good rounds in there. Putting on a good event does not merit an immediate rematch, and the reason why you didn't have two more good rounds in there is because he stopped you. Kevin says this like the fight was somehow interrupted instead of actually being finished. I said I wasn't going to, I was going to scream and holler, I'm not fighting again until they give me a rematch. Felt like I deserved it. That's what it should have been. Well, then you can just sit on your ass and wait because he beat you fair and square while you were the only one who had an advantage since you missed weight. So you have no reason at all to feel that you deserve a rematch of Charles. Zero. I, I feel like a rematch should be warranted. You know, we, we, we put on a good fight and uh, we did it when, you know, there there really shouldn't have been a fight that weekend. You know, all the rest of these fights got canceled and, and all that. So I'm still trying to push for a rematch. Yeah, you told UFC that you want to you want another crack at him. Yeah. The look on Luke's face says it all. Charles went through the same circumstances that you did, Kevin, and he made weight. Ain't nobody beat me yet. You know, it's only been me beating myself. Why did you lose to Tony? I, I beat myself. <sighs> I choked myself out. And these guys ain't even choking me. It's me. Cho you know, I'm getting choked. I think I'm choking myself, so... I don't know about y'all, but I've never actually seen a fighter inside the UFC actually choke themselves out. I've seen a couple guys knock themselves out, but not choke. That's really all you're fighting for is your respect. You know, people respect you for being a UFC fighter when you when when they hear the name, like you they automatically kind of give you some respect. We're not doing it really for the money. Of course I'm excited for the money. People respect money more than anything. I'm just being honest with you, Ariel. The, the UFC, they, they basically told me they don't want to see me win. They don't want to see me do it. So so I, I got to do the hardest fights out there, and, and that's what I'm going to do until uh, I really break through to some people and, and really show them again that, that uh, I, I'm – look, I'm going to hold the title. So I don't give a fuck about none of this. As long as I keep doing what I got to do, I'm holding that title. They can, they can talk about who they want to. They can X me out of however many conversations that they want to. That, none of that shit going to matter once I get the title. So, so that, that, that's where my head is at. Really? Is that why they put you in an undeserved interim title fight against Tony? Or gave you a bounce back fight against D-Rod? How about you just stop pretending that the man is out to get you and admit that you failed? It's this exact attitude as to why Kevin never reached the heights of being a champion. Sorry, nobody considers winning a vacant title in a non-existent weight division under Eagle FC against a 40-year-old fresh off of COVID zombified version of Diego Sanchez as being a legitimate world champion. Very sorry to hear this news. Shocking news to me and so many others. Could you tell me when you found out that you were being released from the UFC? Uh, yesterday morning through email, you know. That, that, that was kind of the worst part about it. Didn't really uh, have the proper uh, notice or even get a phone call about it. No phone call, no text, no nothing, an email. From who? Uh, from Tracy, who sends out all the bout agreements. So it wasn't even from Sean or, or Hunter or Dana or any of these guys. And uh, honestly, that's what pisses me off the most is, is the lack of respect. Shocking news to you and so many others. How long has Ariel been watching the sport again? This news wasn't a shock at all. I actually saw it coming. He was 1-4 in his last five, had missed weight a couple times, and got suspended by USADA. Where's the shocking part? Are we still pretending that Kevin Lee has star potential? You'd think that him being let go from the UFC was the next logical step. I mean, he's no Sam Alvey. However, the egotistical Kevin Lee wasn't prepared to accept reality and came up with his own conspiracy theories as to why the UFC really let him go. Have you heard from them since? Anything? Um, I, I heard from Hunter. He, he kind of fed me some bullshit. <laughs> but uh, not from nobody else. Okay. So when you get that email, what is your reaction? Um, first, first I'm, I was shocked a little bit. I didn't really understand what, you know, what was going on. But um, yeah, p pissed. is Pissed, a little bit embarrassed. Um, and it really doesn't make much sense to me. Once that last fight was over, and it was a shit fight, you know, I, I'm, I'm the first to admit that. Um, but once that last fight was over and Dana was kind of talking bad on me, I, I had a feeling like something else was going on. You know, I, I don't think it, it necessarily had to do with the fight. Um, of course, that's what they're going to tell me. You know, I'm on a two fight losing streak or whatever. I, I, I think there was more 
uh, politics and stuff going on behind the scenes, and I got caught in the middle of that. As you know, no breaking news here. Francis himself has talked about it on the show. Francis Ngannou, who's also represented by your uh, manager slash agent, Markel Martin of CAA, uh, they're not seeing eye to eye. Markel and the UFC aren't seeing eye to eye. Uh, there's CAA, there's Endeavor. They don't see eye to eye because they're two of the biggest talent agencies on the planet. I think you may have been caught in the middle. And the fact that you had the USADA thing, the fact that you had the two fight losing streak is a good reason to say, hey, let's go our separate ways. You could be a champion somewhere else, make some money and maybe come back here. But in reality, uh, you can't get rid of the heavyweight champ right now. So it's a lot easier to get rid of the guy who doesn't have a belt around his waist. Am I crazy or is that the politics that you were referring to? Um, it could be. You know, we speculating right now. Yeah. I didn't hear that from a definite. I, I, uh, Dana didn't call me on the phone and tell me that. So uh, we speculating. But but if I was speculating right, I, I would think so. In recent years, Kevin was losing more than he was winning, was plagued with injuries, kept missing weight, and just lost to an unranked fighter who was obviously his last straw. Kevin being oblivious to his current career status isn't shocking to me, but Ariel being surprised was. Perhaps he was too close to Kevin at this point to take a step back and accurately assess the situation. No one has actually reached out to you and said, thanks for your services, much respect, God bless, good luck in your future endeavors. Exactly. Ain't that some shit? Yeah. I mean, honestly, yeah, that's you know, the politics are a way of life. Every job has politics and you have to deal with it. You know, that's just life. Um, but not even to get a phone call, that, that actually would bother me more than the politics. Like getting caught up in some politics is like, okay, that's just, you know, the way it is. But to not even get like a phone call lasts 60 seconds, 90 seconds. And I think it goes a long right. way. I feel for you when I hear that. And that's, uh, that is disappointing to hear. I personally thought this was overdramatic because I never felt as strongly about social etiquette when it comes to firing someone over an email or an actual phone call. To me, it just seemed like Ariel's bitterness towards Dana and the UFC trying to stir Lee's pot even more, being as that Kevin was already looking for more reasons to get butthurt when it came to the company. Uh, it ain't a whole lot of fame in this shit. So it's like, okay, I, I, I've done all this shit for y'all. I've put myself on my, and put my body on the line just to end up with, you know, an alcohol problem and some tax problems. And at the end of the day, you take my respect away from me too. It's like, okay, well then, you know, shit. I see this all the time where people misuse the word disrespect or getting respect. The UFC did not disrespect Kevin Lee for cutting him when he was two and five in his last seven. He failed to do his job. If you screw up at your job and get fired for it, are the people who fired you disrespectful or did you mess up? The UFC has always cut people with losing records. This is nothing new. Kevin Lee was such a victim here. I'm surprised him and Willie don't get together and go bowling. Also, you didn't do this for them. You did this for yourself and they did a lot for you. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to lie. I'm a, I'm a little still emotional right now. So, so you know, I'm, I'm obviously I'm pissed. Um, uh a lot of people telling me not to not to bash him and keep keep the keep the bridge open, right? They're sure. telling me that. Okay, yeah, you you can come back at some point. Honestly, I don't really I don't really want to. Why would I want to work with somebody who who you know is uh, is, is you know going to disrespect me like that? That's crazy. Oh, Kevin, let's not pretend that it's up to you. Like you have the choice to go back or not. Perhaps if he can find better names to fight than Diego Sanchez and go on a long run, then maybe it's possible for him to return. Loyalty uh, and respect mean a lot to me and a lot more than money even. Um, so when people do kind of show their real colors, their, their true colors, then, then it just shows how that person is. But it's not going to make me change how I am. So by, by them, you know, cutting me and... and and, and making a bullshit excuses for it, uh, it, it doesn't, it's not going to make me turn on the people that's really with me, you know? There's another crutch word, disloyal. The UFC wasn't disloyal or disrespectful for firing a fighter who couldn't do his job. You know, win more fights than he loses, make weight, not fail a USADA test. My, my only goal and objective right now is to show that they just made one of the worst mistakes that they did. Kevin sounds like one of those sad American Idol rejects who claims that they're going to show you. How dare you not pick them? He'll be a bigger star than you can ever imagine. Wake up, Kevin. 
The UFC has gotten rid of way bigger names than him in recent years alone, like Overeem and JDS, both who sold way more pay-per-views and main events than Kevin ever did. Facts were never Kevin Lee's friend. It's it's like, you know, if if you ask girl out and then she says no and then you say he was ugly anyway. Meanwhile, Bellator didn't even want Kevin and they are thirsty for UFC leftovers. Bellator came out and said they weren't interested. Were you a little bit surprised by that, especially with the fact that your brother's uh, part of their promotion as well? No, I, because I wasn't interested in Bellator. I think it's time for the sport to get bigger, not just the UFC or not just Bellator, not just PFL. You know, it's now it's like, OK, let's make MMA as big as it could possibly be. UFC is where it's at, and, and, and you don't want it to be too many organizations either. You know what I mean? Right. Then it's got WBC, WBA with boxing. Yeah, can't get them to fight. It's like that's yeah, fucking terrible. That's why I'm a huge fan of the sport in general too. So I want to see the sport do good, and, and having us all under one roof definitely does help. It's also being a UFC champion just fucking means more. Way more. It just means way, way more. Way more. And yeah. I, and I'm gonna do it. This is called sour grapes which is someone who adopts a negative attitude towards something they can't have themselves. You saw from these clips how he felt about the UFC being the premier promotion when he was still with them, with all his hopes and dreams. He only changed his mind after the UFC cut him after his career did a nosedive. After getting cut from the UFC and rejected by Bellator, Kevin signed with his hero's promotion, Eagle FC, which is a smaller organization led by Khabib. I feel like we can accomplish a lot in this sport and we can do a lot that these other promotions that they just ain't doing. And I, I feel like we could take them all over. So what? Bro, what are you talking about, man? Our past was never really like one built on animosity, mm. to be honest with you. It, it was more so I saw what he was capable of way before anybody else did and, and way before um, he, he became a champion or anything like that. That's why I wanted to fight him. Are you saying that these guys like, you know, Habib, these guys are overrated, that we in the media overrate them for whatever reason, and that guys you like... You definitely do. Khabib's good, but he ain't, he ain't there. Was today the first time that you ever actually met him? Yeah, yeah. Wow. First time I actually ever met him in person. Wow. Uh, we, we didn't have to go into, into, you know, oh, I wanted to fight you, and then now we cool. We didn't even have to speak on all that, you know? You, you could just kind of tell... Uh, off a man's eyes sometimes uh, with the messages behind it. And uh, I'm going to let the action speak for, for you know, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to shed some blood for him. So all good. No, it wasn't awkward. No tension. Nothing like that. No, nah, no, nah, no tension. I mean, Khabib, Khabib's a respectful guy, you know, he, he's uh, he, he gets a lot of respect for a reason. He, he So there, there's no no tension, no nothing like that. Is there a possibility of you going back to the UFC in the future? Do you think this is it? You're just going to continue, you know, fighting for Eagle FC or, or somewhere else? You, you know, to be honest, I'm, I'm not too uh, excited about going and just being a part of any any type of fold, you know, just be one of the guys. Uh, it, if I do, it'll, it'll be um, maybe a co-promotion or something like that, you know, possibly. Uh, only reason I would go back now is, is for a rematch with Charles Oliveira. So if they come back with that, give me a direct re rematch with Charles, then okay, yeah. Otherwise, uh, I'm going to go about my business and wish him the best of luck. Is that Lee's stipulation for him to grace the UFC with his presence again? He can stop pretending that him not fighting in the UFC anymore was his choice. I'm sure that Kevin's well aware that the days where the UFC co-promotes have long passed. Since the UFC absorbed most of the major companies, the idea of them co-promoting with anyone is simply beneath them. It would be like the NFL letting one of their teams play against an XFL team. There's nothing for them to gain. I'm pretty sure that Kevin knows this, but he's still sticking to his failed gimmick where he pretends that he moves the needle and can make things happen when he clearly cannot. With Eagle FC acquiring Kevin, they wanted to create a 165-pound division just for him. So who did they manage to get to face him with their ever-expanding roster? You already know, it's Diego Sanchez, the former Tough One winner and UFC vet who's now 40 and was recently released from the hospital due to lingering effects from COVID. That's the fight. Get Zombie Diego in there to face Kevin. This will show the world that he's the best 165 pounder. I haven't fought a Diego Sanchez in my career yet. I don't. I don't get them kind of kind of softballs. Lee assumed that this was a layup for him to win the title, which it should have been. So of course he talked himself up, thinking that Diego was going to be an easy fight for him. I'm not looking at the title right now. I'm not looking past Diego Sanchez. I hope he knows what he's in for. This is this is going to be a a, a a very serious fight. And I feel like I flipped the switch. This is, this is not going to be a sparring match. 
it's not going to be none of that. He, he will get hurt, and it's going to be a good fight. Diego, when he says that you're going to get hurt, your response to that? Been there, done that. Heard that before. You know, I've been in, been in there. It, for, to me, it's just a fight. It's just another fight. You know, I've, I fought so many big names. I fought legends. There, there's a difference here is that I'm better than anybody else that he's fought. I hope you got somebody good in your corner that's looking out for you. Yeah, good people, good people. All right, they'll throw in the towel? Uh, they won't need to. This is going to be a great fight. It's going to be a turning point in my career. I pray to God every day that I don't kill this man, and I'm going to put a whole lot of hurt on him. Once again, Lee oversold himself to be better than he was. The fight would end with Kevin winning by decision, but the only real damage done was from Diego with those leg kicks. Are we sure that Diego was in the hospital and not in a lab experimented on by the government, giving him some sort of Captain America super serum? Or did Lee simply not deliver yet again? Also, why the hell was this fight only three rounds? Does Equal FC not do five rounders for title fights for some odd reason? That probably benefited Lee in all honesty because his legs were shot, and if there's one thing Diego still has, it's cardio. I'm built for five rounds. <laughs> At the end of the day, I found Kevin to be as likable as old Rose was at the end of Titanic, when she tosses away her family's potential wealth like Lee threw away his dignity in most of his interviews. All in all, the man does what 99% of us can't. He's an alpha who lives a good life, but he's just not as good or as big of a deal as he sold himself to be, proving that actions really do speak louder than words, even if those words were lifted from Connor. I've been seeing the holes for many years. Fuck Connor, I ain't trying to be like none of that. If anything, he trying to be like me. I feel like I'm already top five in his division. I'm built for five rounds.